Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to another episode of the Talking Sira podcast. Um, today we will speak about how the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam approached the tribes during the Hajj season to seek protection for the da'wah. Um, before we do this, let's have a quick recap of the last couple of episodes. So in the last episode we spoke about the Isra wal Mi'raj um, and how this event signified the importance of Al-Aqsa and its surrounding areas as well, especially in this uh, climate we have today where uh, this land is being surrendered and uh, you know, there are various uh, regimes and Arab uh, nations and leaders who are seeking to normalize uh, the relation with uh, the occupiers, the, the Zionists. Um, so this event of Israq wa Mihraj really signified this importance and, and why we should understand the blessed uh, status of Al-Aqsa and why we shouldn't be accepting the surrender on, and, uh, of this land and, and we should be calling out those who are uh, normalizing relations. Um, we also spoke about how this event, this Israq wa Mihraj was a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam um, because it you know this event uh, the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam was able to meet uh, various uh, great prophets of allah alayhi wasallatu wasallam and he was um, you know he led them in prayer and he was shown to be given that status of leadership uh, amongst the other prophets and allah also commanded the obligation of salah um, which uh, was another blessing so this event really highlighted to the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he was he was on the right path. He was, he was, uh, you know, he should continue with what he was doing, even though he had a very difficult year in the year of sorrow, where he lost his beloved wife, Khadija bin Khuwailid radiyallahu anha, and he also lost his beloved uncle Abu Talib, who was his, you know, protector and supporter whilst he was given da'wah to the uh, the people of uh, Mecca. Um, but after losing this protection, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he approached the tribe of uh, Thaqif in At-Taif and it, this links to today's episode because when he approached uh, this tribe he was seeking protection for the Dawah as well but um, as we know and as we spoke about they rejected him in the most kind of rudest and humiliating of ways uh, they stoned him, they pelted him with stones, they basically drew, drove him out of their land uh, whilst he was bleeding so they rejected this uh, this offer for protecting the Dawah and the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he returned to Mecca under the protection of Mut'im ibn Uday. Um, however, this protection was merely personal protection. It was protection for his life, for, for his person, person um, for him himself, rather than for the da'wah. Because the hostility of Quraysh uh, and the harsh nature that, um, and environment that the Muslims were facing remained in Mecca. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to seek protection from the other tribes, um, many of those who came for, for, for the Hajj season um, and had encamped uh, in Mecca, in, in the Mina, Mina region, as, as we have today when, you know, where, where, where there are many nations that come and uh, people from various nations that uh, do Hajj. Very similar, obviously, it was uh, much, much more earlier times. But it was a similar situation where the tribes were encamped and uh, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had the opportunity to approach them and seek protection for the da'wah. So one of the questions that we want to speak about and kind of address is that, you know, there have been some claims, some dubious claims really, um, which where people or brothers have said that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was seeking uh, a different kind of support. Um, Nusra, you can call it. So he was seeking Nusra, but uh, some brothers claim that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was seeking uh, Nusra for power, to seize power, and not merely Nusra or protection for the Dawah. And this is quite important because um, it really has a pivotal impact on how we understand the method of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to establish the first Islamic state. And also, it obviously makes a, has a very 
big impact on how we understand the seerah and the method of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to re-establish the Islamic state and, and resume the Islamic way of life in accordance to the method of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it's a vital discussion to make sure that we understand this and also implement the correct methodology and adopt the correct methodology uh, of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the confusion that may arise in what type of support the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi was seeking from the tribes um, perhaps is because there are different types of support or different types of Nusra that can be found in the Seerah. And we've spoken about a few already. So just to break these down, there are three types. Uh, the first type of Nusra or support, you could call it, is uh, personal protection. Uh, which is in Arabic jiwar. So this is the protection that relates to the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself from being harmed personally, uh, and this was provided uh, to him by Abu Talib when he was alive. And as as we've spoken about, this is now when the when his uncle passed away and died. Uh, this protection, this personal protection, was provided to him by Motim ibn Uday when he returned from Ataif. So this is the first type of support or protection. The second support is the, uh, the protection of the da'wah. So this is the protection and support so that the Messenger wasallam and his group of companions can continue with their da'wah and convey the message, message of Islam safely until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them victory. I.e. until the society has been transformed with the correct ideas of Islam um, and you know, because of that security that he had, uh, this can happen, and then eventually, obviously, we will get to a stage where the people and society want to be ruled by Islam, and they give leadership to uh, the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, or any any leader for that matter in future. And the and the third um, type of protection or nusra or support is the support to seize power or the support for authority, and this um, is not to be. Uh, obtained at any stage this is only when that society has been now transformed and the people have been prepared and there's a popular base uh, where the people and their representatives want to be um, live under Islam they want a leadership that represents Islam and they want to give allegiance to a leader to rule by Islam and to implement the systems of, of Islam um, and this again can be compared in the seerah to the second pledge of Aqaba where the people of Ansar, the Aus and Khazraj um, of Yathrib, they um, basically they gave their pledge to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But we will speak about this in a later session. So these are the three types of Nusra. So going back to this incident in which the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam is now seeking Nusra from the tribes, what type of support is he seeking? That's the question. It's not number one. It's not personal protection because. As we have said, he already has personal protection. Uh, it was firstly, it was in the case of Abu Talib when he was alive. He had that protection from his uncle and his other uncles. But now, uh, as we said, um, Mutim ibn Uday is providing that personal protection. So it's not number one because that is not required. That's already in place. Um, also, it's not number t number three, uh, the support to seize power because authority and power can only come if and when the people have been transformed, when society has been transformed. This had not occurred with the tribes because, you know, this was the first time they were hearing the message of Islam and no transformation of society had occurred. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam merely was approaching them uh, to seek protection of the Dawah, which was the, the second type of support we spoke about. Um, support and protection of the da'wah so that the Messenger وسلم, and his companions could convey the message of Islam safely until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them victory and that society had been transformed. So this is the protection and nusra that the Messenger was seeking from the tribes. Protection of the da'wah. And we will demonstrate this. We will see that in every conversation that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had with the tribes, uh, this is what the what he was seeking. And it was quite clear from the narrations is that this is what he's seeking. 
Um, Al-Waqidi in his seerah states that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam approached the various tribes and he stated the following Who is the man who will take me to his people and protect me so that I can convey the message of my Lord? For indeed Quraysh have prevented me from conveying the message of my Lord. So it's quite clear in this um, narration from Waqidi that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is seeking protection of the da'wah so that he can complete his mission. So that he can continue safely and not have these barriers that Quraysh had now put in front of him. He could safely convey the message of Islam and uh, transform society so that he could eventually become the leader. But this is what he was seeking. He was seeking protection of the da'wah. And he was not, as some people claim and some brothers claim, he was not looking to seize power. He was not looking for power and authority for this uh, this, type, this type of Nusra. Um, he was merely seeking protection of the da'wah. So let's go through a few examples of the conversations that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had to demonstrate this, but also seek some, um, obviously seek some be- benefit and lessons from um, this uh, this event and this in- these incidents of, of the conversations the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had with these tribes. Um, one of the things that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did is that he asked Abu Bakr and his uncle Abbas and in some narrations even Ali to help him identify uh, the tribes that had the capability of protecting the da'wah. So whilst um, identifying the various tribes, uh, Abu Bakr, who was obviously an expert in genealogy, he, he um, wanted to identify those tribes who were known for their strength, known for their kind of capability. So that the protection that the, they would be able to give the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would be respected by the enemies in terms of the Quraysh would know that you know these tribes are strong and they um, are capable of are capable of protecting the Muslims, um, but also that they um, had the capability to protect Islam from all sides, not just the Quraysh. Um, so this was very important, and Abu Bakr. Um, knew which tribes to identify, but also he would ask these questions in the first instance of how mu- you know how many numbers do you have? What is your military military capability? And this was not because they were seizing, seeking to seize power, but rather it was to make sure that the tribe that was going to protect the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the Muslims were capable of protecting the Muslims, so that he could continue to give da'wah. So that first tribe. Uh, the first tribe that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam approached was the tribe of Kinda. Um, and he started off with inviting them to Islam. And then he asked them to support him so that he could convey this message safely until Allah gave him victory. And Kinda responded to this fairly positively. Uh, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to them, uh, would you like to achieve good? Uh, and they asked, how would that be? Uh, and then the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, You would bear witness that there is no God but Allah and would, would engage in prayer and believe in Allah's message. And the tribe of Kinda, the people, representatives, they replied, If you are successful, will you grant us power after yourself? So they were seeking power after the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and authority. And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam replied, Power and authority rests with Allah. He places it where he wishes. So they responded, we don't need what you bring. Have you come to us to keep us from our gods and have you have us go to war with the Arabs? Remain with your people, we have no need for you. And this was narrated in, in Ibn Kathir and, uh, and also in Al-Bidayah or Nihaya. So in this uh, conversation, you can see that the, the, the tribe of Kinda, they recognize that this message that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had brought, uh, had you know, you could tell you know they could tell that it had um, kind of uh, an expansionary expansionary nature. It had a, a nature which would want to dominate. So in understanding and recognizing this, they asked that after you have been successful, because they would obviously protect the Messenger of Allah and he would continue to give his dawah, and eventually he could be successful. Would the Messenger of Allah then, after he passes away? give authority to them and the messenger sallam responded no you know this is something that rests with allah and he cannot give it to anyone it's it's with allah so 
uh, they rejected the offer, but also the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam rejected their protection because they he was not willing to accept a protection that had conditions placed on it, i.e. that they should be given authority after the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This was not part of the offer and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam rejected this. And a lesson just to take from here is that even in this dire situation, in the situation where uh, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Muslims were uh, you know, came to a stalemate where the Quraysh had put so many bar- barriers up that the Dawah had stalled. Um, in this situation, the Messenger of Salam still was unwilling to compromise. Um, and he was unwilling to promise them something that was in the hands of Allah. Um, you know, they, they, he realized that the acceptance of this con- uh, offer of protection was based on this condition that they would obtain power afterwards and this showed uh, an element of insincerity because they weren't they weren't merely giving uh, accepting the offer based on uh, you know a sincere belief in Allah and the fact that they wanted to support Islam rather they had political ambitions they wanted power and authority after the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam which obviously was not a sincere aim so uh, the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam rejected this, and he didn't want to compromise. And this is, we will find that in every conversation, every action the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam did, he was very clear and blunt in what he was saying. It was to the point, and he wasn't willing to compromise in his message of Islam, uh, even though you know he would face rejection and he, even ridicule. He was not willing to compromise, and it reminds us of uh, some events that we have seen recently where. You know, for example, this uh, interview that we saw with the BBC, I think it was uh, Emma Barnett um, of the BBC, who was interviewing the the new head of the MCB, Zara Muhammad. And she asked Zara Muhammad, as, as most of you probably know, you know, how many women imams are there? And rather than Zara Muhammad coming back and providing a clear answer, uh, an uncompromised answer, an answer that was just really to the point and to the truth, really, um, and say that there, there are no women imams and the fact that Allah and Islam does not uh, allow this because you know imams in Islam is not you know that is not the duty of women that's the duty of men and women have other duties and rather than answer it in a clear and blunt way that Islam demands and the messenger demands uh, Zara Muhammad obviously started to dig herself into a very deep hole in trying to either kind of beat around the bush and not answer the question that was a very simple question uh, or or try to um, kind of move it on to something else where you could see that the interviewer was really trying to push for an answer a very simple question with a very simple answer as well um, and this just really shows and highlights that even though the MCB have appointed the first woman or female leader of the you know of the of the organization the non-muslims aren't happy they want to Essentially, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the Jews and Christians will not be happy with you until you have uh, you accept their way. Um, and this is a clearly demonstrated in this example that um, even after this kind of liberal action, you could call it, or modern uh, moderate action of the MCB of appointing the first female head of their organization, they weren't happy. And, and as Muslims, we should always seek to speak the truth, speak it blunt- bluntly and not sway, not sway away from... Uh, the answer uh, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did the same here as well in this example where even though um, there was a positive response from Khinda, the tribe of Khinda, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi was unwilling to accept it because it had these conditions that um, you know it was a compromise and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would not accept any compromise in the deen and he's, he was willing to carry on with the uh, the tough and harsh environment as long as he could uh, he could bear um, and, and he would only accept something that was legitimate in Islam and not compromise. So a clear example here. Um, the, the other example we want to speak about, um, he, and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam approached many tribes uh, and many rejected him. But some of these examples we just want to bring a uh, highlight where there was close acceptance of the, of the offer, but actually there were conditions placed. And, and, and it really highlights to us that... Um, of this approach we're speaking about, this non-compromising approach of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So another tribe that the uh, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam approached was uh, Banu Amr ibn Sa'asa. Uh, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
approached them because they were known to be militarily strong and they had a ca- the capability to protect the da'wah from the enemies. Um, Ibn Hisham narrates that when the Messenger invited them to Islam and sought their support and protection, a man named Buhaira ibn Firas said, uh, By Allah, if I were to take with me this young man from Quraysh, I would use him to eat up the Arabs. Meaning he again recognized the nature and message of Islam, that it would dominate. And he's saying that if he would kind of uh, take on Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would be able to um, have political power and dominance. So again, a very insincere uh, thinking behind some of this. So he he too asked the same question of Kinder. He said, suppose we follow you in your affair and suppose Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes you victorious over those who oppose you. Will the matter of leadership return to us after you die? So again, he's asking the same question that when uh, you gain leadership, uh, when you know when you have this success from Allah, what will happen after you die? Will we obtain that leadership? And again, the, the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, via his uncompromised stance, he said the same: the matter rests with Allah. He places leadership wherever he pleases. And Buhaira responded uh, negatively. He said, "You know, will you make our throats targets for the Arabs?" For the cause of us protecting you, again he, he he's highlighting what the, the 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 whole aim was to protect the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and then when Allah gives you victory, the matter of leadership will be given to those other than us. We have no need of your affair, meaning we have no need of Islam. So again, they placed this condition on the offer of protection. Even from this narration, we can see that you know. They were seeking. They were. They were being asked for protection of the power, um, the dawah, and they were not being asked for power, because they stated when Allah gives you victory and leadership, they didn't say if, you know, if if they knew that uh, they were being asked to give the messenger power and leadership, they would never have said when. But they recognized that th- this is not what the Messenger of was seeking. He was merely seeking protection of the dawah so he could continue, and when. Because they recognized that Islam had this nature uh, to dominate and that it was an ideology that was seeking to dominate over all other ways. Because they recognized, as they said, when you are successful, when Allah gives you victory, then would we have leadership before um, after you. So again, this really highlights the fact that what the, what the Nusra was about. It was about protecting the da'wah. And the other point, obviously, it highlights that the Messenger ﷺ was unwilling to compromise. And this was another insincere acceptance because it had these conditions attached that the Messenger, messenger ﷺ uh, obviously declined. So that was another example. Uh, the, the third example we want to speak about um, is the, the example of Banu Shayban. And this is very interesting. Banu Shayban bin Thalaba is uh, a very interesting uh, incident occurred. So the Messenger وسلم, was taken and Abu Bakr actually, obviously he had this uh, understanding and knowledge of genealogy. He accompanied, accompanied the Messenger وسلم, and he said, may my parents be sacrificed for you None besides them are more honourable than this tribe. So basically, this tribe of Banu Shayban was known to be very honourable and strong. Um, Abu Bakr then had a conversation with one of their leaders, Mafruq. So Abu Bakr asked Mafruq, what is your number? Again, trying to test that capability. Are they capable to protect uh, the da'wah? And Mafruq replied, we are 1,000 in number and 1,000 is no little figure, meaning... We have, we have enough capability. Uh, Abu Bakr continued, And how strong are you in battle? And Mafruq answered, We are we always struggle, for every nation is bound to struggle. So meaning they put their all in when it comes to battle. Then Abu Bakr further inquired, What about the result of the battles between you and your enemies? And Mafruq, uh, he responded, When we fight, we are in one of our furies and the battle is enraged. Meaning they have this anger and determination when they fight. We prefer our horses to our children and we prefer our weapons to milk and animals. Again, really highlighting their strength and their nature for being strong in battle and preferring battle over kind of the the normal life. Uh, And he says, so far as the victory is, so far as the victory, this is confirmed uh, with Allah, meaning the victory is from Allah. 
So Abu Bakr then introduced uh, them to the uh, to Mafruq to the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and Mafruq asked Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "O brother of Quraysh, to what do you invite us?" Then the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "I call you to witness that there is no god but Allah, and that I am His messenger, and that you will shelter me and protect me until I discharge the duty placed upon me by Allah." Again, highlighting, "Until I fulfill my duty." So it's not about leadership or power. It's about protecting the dawa so that he can continue and fulfill his duty. Then Mufruq asked the question, what do you preach? To which the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recited uh, the surah, some verses from Surah Al-Anam. And Mufruq inquired, tell me something more about your preaching. O oh my Qureshi brother, by Allah this speech is not um, of any who inhabits the earth. So he understood that. This was from Allah. If it were theirs, they, we would recognize them. Meaning, if it was a speech of people and human beings, then Mafruq would, would have recognized that this was a speech of men. But he, he was uh, obviously astonished by the words and he understood that this was miraculous and it was from, uh, from Allah. It wasn't from, from mankind. So the Messenger وسلم, recited um, verses of the Quran. He said that Allah commands justice and the doing of good. And giving help to kith and kin, Allah forbids evil deeds, uh, munkar and rebellious actions. He admonishes uh, you so that you may take heed. So, again, the, um, the the you know this conversation was going down very positively, and the mafruk he then he introduced the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam to some of the other leaders, the the, the religious leader who was Hani ibn uh, Khabisa and Muthanna ibn Haritha, who was the, the military commander of war. And Hab, Hani ibn Khabisa, he um, responded that although he kind of reacted positively, he, he was unwilling to accept because he felt that he needed to go back to his people and speak to his people about this affair before accepting uh, this offer of protection, protection of the da'wah. Um, but then when the conversation with Muthanna, this is where it became even more interesting. Um, so Muthanna explained to the Messenger ﷺ, who was a military general, he said that we have a treaty with Kisra, who was the emperor of Persia, um, due to which we are staying here. Mean, meaning they're staying in a certain location where the emperor of Persia have given them protection to, to stay there. According to this treaty, we are not authorized to raise any new movement or give refuge to any such person who initiates a new movement. And I feel that this matter which you are inviting to us is what the kings detest. If you need our help against those in Arabia, we are ready for that. So again, there are conditions placed that this tribe of Banu Shayban, they are willing to protect the Messenger and the Dawah from the Arabs and the Quraysh, but they were unwilling to provide that protection from Kisra and, and, and Persia, the Persians. So the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam responded and said, you know, he, he responded positively because they were honest and he said, you have not answered in an ill manner and you have spoken truthfully. However, the deen of Allah will be supported only by those who guard it from all directions. And then he ended, which is very interesting, with a prophecy. He said that, suppose that only a short period of time passes and Allah makes you inherit their land and their homes and their women. Will you then glorify and worship and exalt Allah? And then the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam arose and left. He left the assembly. So here you can see that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam declined their offer again because they had placed the condition where they would only pro provide protection from the Arabs, from the Quraysh, but not from the Persians. But we know that you know protection must be from all sides, not just from one side. And this is a key lesson because when it comes to defending Islam, even us and, uh, as Muslims, any any Muslim, we must defend it from all sides. And there is a hadith that comes to mind uh, when you know that links with this, where the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Each one of you Muslims is on the front line and on the trenches of Islam. Allah, Allah, let not Islam be penetrated from your side." So. Here, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, let, you know, he said, don't let Islam be penetrated from your side, not from any side, because as a Muslim Ummah, we must protect it from all sides. 
So as Muslims and as defenders of Islam, we have to protect Islam from every direction. And likewise, we can only accept protection from those who are willing to protect Islam from every side, as demonstrated by the Messenger when he rejected this offer from Banu Shayban. And subhanAllah, of the tribes that the Messenger went to, Banu Shayban actually responded in the most positive ways. They were honest, they wanted to protect, but they were unwilling to uh, protect from the side of Persia because they feared that you know they would be uh, attacked by Kisra and the Emperor of Kisra, who, you know, the Persians at the time, they were the superpower of the time. So they had this fear from the Persians. But subhanAllah, the amazing decree you know and and you know the the, the decree of allah and also the uh, fulfillment of the prophecy of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam only after around 10 years after this happened um after the, and when when banu shayban they became muslim under the khilafa of abu bakr it was in fact banu shayban who would fight against the persians that they once feared it was the same al muthanna who we mentioned the the leader of the, the military leader of Banu Shayban. It was the same Al Muthanna who led the army um, under the Khilafah of Abu Bakr against the Persians and defeated the Persians in Iraq. So imagine, you know, this is another clear lesson for us that they, this tribe, they declined the offer to protect the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and protect the Dawah based on this fear of the Persians. But Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala showed them who they should truly fear. And you know they it was a blessing because it was the, it was them that tribe that themselves that defeated the Persians, and it is a lesson for us that no matter how big the enemy or the superpower may be, as the Persians were, they are insignificant to the might and power of Allah. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, as we say. And even today, you know, there may be a superpower that we have, obviously, um, in the Americans that may have this, uh, you know supposed strength and power and they are the, the sole superpower of the world today and many will have this fear that they are undefeatable it's impossible for the muslims to defeat them but when we have allah on our side when we follow that path and not compromise the deen when we protect the deen from all sides you know allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will will give us the ability and give us the capability of defeating anyone any superpower as he did with the Muslims back then and, and, the, and the best of generations under the leadership of Abu Bakr, um, as we found. And, and it was the same people who had feared the Persians that were the ones who actually defeated the, the Persians, subhanAllah. One other thing to note from this, these incidents um, that, of, the, of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam approaching the tribes is that um, when the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam approached them, um, and we've only given a few examples. There were many examples where, like I said, the Messenger of Islam was rejected in the rudest of ways. Um, and then obviously there were some examples here where uh, the tribes had placed certain conditions on their offers. To make matters worse, uh, Abu Jahl, who is you know, the, the, the arch enemy of Islam, and also Abu Lahab, they, they would follow the Messenger of Islam and would try to undo and counteract his efforts by spreading lies and discrediting him. And this led to many tribes concluding uh, the fact that, you know, his people knew him best. So if they've rejected him, well, you know, why should we accept his message? And many of the tribes said this because this is what it seemed like to them. If the Quraysh, who are honourable tribe, they've rejected him, who are we to accept him and his message? And, you know, this was obviously reinforced by the actions of Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab, who would go on this smear campaign and this campaign to discredit and undo the efforts of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this really highlights and shows to us that the extent the enemies of Allah are willing to go to discredit the da'wah and to discredit the message of Islam. Even today, you know, the enemies of Islam and the hypocrites do their utmost to, you know, quote unquote, prevent Muslims from understanding the mission of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, they're happy with Islam remaining in the homes and the masjid. But once Islam is shown to be an ideological threat to the current status quo that they, you know, they want to uh, continue its dominance, when Islam is shown to be a threat against this, you know, they will use all their tool, tools and their agenda uh, and, and their plans 
everything that they have to their disposal, they will use it to discredit Islam, as we can clearly see today. So this is something we need to be aware of. And even in this case of the Messenger, what he did, he, he was aware of this. He understood what the Quraysh were trying to do. So to, to avoid being followed and to avoid Abu Lahab and Abu Jahl kind of undoing his efforts, the Messenger وسلم, would visit the tribes during the dark hours, in kind of the unsociable hours, so that his efforts would not be undone and he would not be followed. And he'd also visit their homes and their camps so that the conversations were kept private and not in the plain sight of the enemy. Likewise, we should have this similar attitude that we should adopt that best style and approach uh, to convey the message of Islam and the true message of Islam and, and convey the mission of the Messenger وسلم, and try to be in intelligent in our da'wah uh, to avoid the traps of the enemies because there are various traps out there uh, that are, are you know they're doing their best and we need to kind of counteract that by th being clever um, adopting those the best styles and and, and doing what the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam would do um, in you know highlighting to the to the people the truth of islam and and and, and why the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam was sent to mankind so to conclude, you know, we've spoken about um, how and why the Messenger ﷺ approached the various tribes. And that was merely, you know, only, not merely, not in the insignificant way, but it was clearly um, to seek protection of the da'wah. That was the specific purpose of the Messenger ﷺ approaching the tribes. We can clearly see that the aim was to protect the da'wah and it was not to seize power or to have some some sort of military coup or it wasn't about seizing power or authority as some brothers have claimed and just on this point it's worth highlighting that the seera of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam as we've spoken about before you know it clearly shows the methodology methodological steps of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in establishing the first islamic state and we must understand and adopt this method in its precise details and understand the precise details to ensure that we don't sway away from the correct path and uh, to resume Islam, the Islamic way of life in the correct manner um, without taking shortcuts or finding ways that would kind of skip essential parts of the method. Every Sira book that you will pick up, right, will we'll split the Sira into three significant and fundamental steps the first phase is the, the the private phase which is the first three years in which the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam had identified uh, the the correct people that would you know embrace islam so that he could establish this core group of sahaba who would embed the ideology within themselves and that they could be that core group that could kind of go out towards society and have that uh, the fundamental beliefs within them and they could obviously give that to in, in public and interact with the masses. That moves us on to the second phase, which was the public phase. This happened in years, you know, from years three to ten, where the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his group of companions interacted with society. And they sought to transform society so that they themselves, the people themselves, would embrace the thoughts and ideas of Islam and give authority to a leadership which represents Islam and implements the laws of Islam which we find in the case of the Ansar, of, in Yathrib, which we will we'll obviously speak about in, in the next episode. And, you know, it was this, uh, this was an essential part of the, the method of the Messenger of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that, you know, it was a successful transformation of that society. Um, and only then did the Messenger of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam move on to the final stage, which is the stage of ruling. It wasn't, uh, there was no shortcuts, there was no acceleration to move to ruling just because it's been too long. The Messenger Sallallahu persisted. He continued and persevered in that, uh, what he needed to do, even though he was in this situation, this very harsh, precarious situation where he was being tortured and, you know, there were various barriers put in place by the Quraysh. Quraysh um, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam continued. And we have to have that same method... Um, mentality of not compromising not looking for shortcuts or trying to find ways for power when the, the objective is not power the objective is that we resume islam in the correct way so that the people want to live by islam and give authority 
or the, the representatives of the people give authority uh, to um, a, a leadership that represents Islam. So seizing power without completing that transformation in society is totally against the, me- the method of the Messenger wasallam. And in fact, it is akin to the methodology of groups such as ISIS or other militant groups who forcibly implement Islam with obtaining authority from the people or the representatives. This is literally the same approach where they just declare that just because they have some sort of military force, they declare the caliphate as we found, obviously. And there's more to say on that, obviously, whether they were funded to do this, but the methodology itself is very similar. Where, where there's been no transformation of society, it's merely a, declar- a declaration um, and, and some sort of military coup, you could call it, a, a militant um, forcibly implementing Islam. And this is not what we want. This is not what the Messenger ﷺ did and not something that we should um, do ourselves because we want to replicate the correct methodology. Um, so inshallah, I hope that, that this is clear and I think it was an important um lesson or episodes to to go through so that it's clear in our minds that you know it's not about me having a go at brothers you know all of us are trying to do the same thing in terms of we want to be sincere in our attempts to bring back islam and resume islam uh, but what i would ask is that we sincerely look at the method of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam understand how we go about implementing this methodology and avoid being in a rush there's there's no rush for this yes it is very sad that you know it has been hundred years or so that since the Khilafah was abolished. You know it's very sad that this is something that we will be accountable for. But the accountability is with you know with you know it's part in the Ummah has this accountability. All of us have this accountability. But taking shortcuts isn't the answer. If we have we have the accountability to pray Salah, we have the accountability to fulfill every obligation. But the only, the only time the obligation is completed correctly is if we follow the methodology correctly. If we take shortcuts or Mr. here and there and, you know, we've never even fulfilled the obligation and there's no there's no value to this. The, the value will not come up in Yawm Al-Qiyamah. However, if we continue to stick to the method of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the correct tariqah to implement the, you know, the fard, then even if it doesn't you know, occur in our lifetime, we will, inshallah, have that argument with to Allah that you know, we tried uh, to support his deen and establish Islam in the correct manner and follow the method of the Messenger It, may, t- it may, t- may take another hundred years, but it's not about time. Time is not the, determin- the determining factor of success. It's not about how long it takes. It's not about it's been too long. We need to do it now. It, it's not about that. It's about our efforts and how we adhere to the methodology of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So, inshallah, I pray this point is clear. And today, you know, I'll, I'll conclude. There. There's many uh, lessons we've taken, and inshallah, everyone has benefited from this. أقول قول حادا واستكفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين فاستكفره إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Thanks for watching that video. For more exclusive videos, please like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget, you can listen to some of our shows wherever you are, because we're also available on all popular podcast platforms. And for more Voice of the Ummah content, make sure you check out the links to all of our social media platforms in the description below.